My name is Shane Harold. I'm a spectroscopy application specialist with Andor, and today I'm going to talk about characterizing low dimensional materials using Raman spectroscopy. So Raman spectroscopy is a technique which is very sensitive to the vibrational modes uh, in a sample. Um, and it's uh, like an infrared absorption spectroscopy that it's sensitive to the vibrational modes of a sample. So these methods are, are considered complementary. But the mechanism is very different. So if we look at this energy level diagram here on the far left in infrared absorption spectroscopy, you have light having the frequency equal to that of a vibrational transition in a sample and the sample directly absorbs a light and the sample is excited from say a ground state to an excited vibrational state. In Raman spectroscopy, you have light come and interact with the sample and the energy of the light here is much, much greater than that of any vibrational transition frequency in the sample. So the light comes in and scatters off a virtual energy state. Now, what happens most of the time is this, this scattering process is elastic, so nothing happens. The light interacts with the sample and comes out having exactly the same energy that it went in. Um, and that's the Rayleigh scattering. To the right of that, however, is the Stokes-Raman scattering. So the light comes and interacts with the sample uh, of this virtual energy state. And the vibrational mode of the sample can actually couple with the, with the light and take some energy away from the light. And so the light comes off the sample having energy slightly less than it came in with. And the difference in that energy is equal to the vibrational transition or a vibrational transition in the sample. And that's called the Stokes-Raman scattering there in, in green. Um, what can also happen is light comes in, interacts with these virtual energy states of the sample, and the vibrations in the sample actually couple with the light and give energy to the light. So the light comes off uh, the sample having energy greater than it went, uh, that it came in with. And that's called anti-Stokes Raman scattering. And the difference there is that is also equal to the vibrational transition of the sample. Now, the Stokes and the anti-Stokes Raman scattering are, are very rare events. So it's about one in a million or one in 10 million photons that interact with the sample actually do this. Um, the rest are just uh, the, the elastic Raleigh scattering. Over to the right, um, we have one of the first Raman spectres obtained by C.B. Raman in uh, 1928. It's a Raman specter of benzene, and it was published in uh, Nature uh, called the negative version of, of radiation. So you can see um, one of the first Raman spectres uh, ever captured. Here's a drawing of a typical uh, Raman experimental setup. So you have a laser that comes in, um, goes off a beam splitter, is focused through this focusing optic onto the sample where the Raman process takes place. Light goes back through the beam splitter and through a filter. Now this filter is chosen such that it is, it is um, optimized to block the excitation wavelength or the, the, the wavelength of the laser beam that you're exciting the sample with. Because if you remember, uh, most of this, this scattering process on the sample is, is, is elastic. So most of the light coming back is going to be um, the light of the laser beam. So you want to block that out. Um, so either use an edge filter or a notch filter here. Um, after the light goes through the filter, it is focused onto the entrance slit of a spectrometer um, where it goes into a focusing mirror onto a grating where the light is dispersed, onto another focusing mirror where it is focused um, at some sort of detector. Here we have a CCD detector, uh, which is detecting your, um, your light. And here we're showing some representative Raman spectra of 2D materials. So box A, we're looking at graphene, where you can see the characteristic G and 2D modes in that material. Uh, box B, we're looking at hexagonal boron nitride, uh, which is an insulator. It's act actually a semiconductor, but the band gap is quite high. So it's often used as an insulator in heterogeneous 2D uh, semiconductor devices. Box C, we're looking at black phosphorus. Uh, box D, topological insulator, business selenide. Uh, down in box E, is semiconductor molybdenum sulfide, and then molybdenum chloride in box F, which has uh, shown promise as, as a magnetic material at elevated temperatures. Um, all of these materials have, have potential applications uh, as 2D materials, and they are all are clearly able to be distinguished uh, and identified and characterized using Raman spectroscopy. Here are some examples of how Raman specificity can be used. So in the upper left-hand graph, uh, box A, we're looking at this Raman spectrum of molybdenum sulfide on the top. And on the bottom, we're looking at uh, tungsten sulfide. And as you go top to bottom, we're changing the mole fraction of tungsten in the sample. So at the top, it's pure molybdenum sulfide. At the bottom, it's pure tungsten sulfide. 
And as you go from top to bottom, you're taking away molybdenum and adding tungsten to the sample. What you can see is that E-band, which starts at about 385 wave numbers for molybdenum sulfide, uh, goes away. And a new E-band uh, at about 345, 350 wave numbers starts to come in for tungsten sulfide uh, because you're changing uh, the chemical composition of the material. Uh, in the top middle, we're looking at Raman structure of, of ice and water, so the same uh, chemical composition but different molecular structure. So the solid line um, is water, looking in the OH stretching region. You can see it's quite quite broad. Uh, the dotted line is uh, the spectrum of ice, and you can see that that really, really tightens up um, as you go from a phase transition from a, a liquid to a solid in that OH stretching region um, of water. The upper right-hand side, we're looking at the effect of um, adding layers to, to a nanomaterial. So this is molybdenum sulfide. On the bottom, uh, it's single layer, and as you go bottom to top, uh, it goes from one layer on the bottom to four layers on the top. Um, now the E12G and the A1G band don't change all that much, but you can see as you begin to add layers, you're getting new bands, low frequency modes uh, from about 20 to 40 wave numbers that are indicative of, of breathing now in shearing modes in the sample. Um, those modes just aren't available when you have a single single layer so that the, the, the sample can't move that way. But as you increase layers, you are introducing additional degrees of freedom in the sample, which you're, you're able to detect using um, Raman spectroscopy. So this is a, a very good way to, to measure the, um, the amount of layers you're, you're making in your sample. And on the bottom left-hand side, we're looking at the effect of, uh, of strain and defect. So this is graphite. Uh, on the bottom, it's, uh, it's pure graphite. The bottom trace so we see that characteristic again g and 2d band um, and then you take and you ball mill this graphite so you introduce strain structural strain to the sample and you can see as you do that um, the the middle graph is after ball milling it for 12 hours you can see that 2d band starts to broaden and you can see that there's uh, a d band that starts to to come in and then the top graph is after you mill it for 24 hours. So you can see that 2D band on the right hand side of the spectrum gets really, really broad. And you're really seeing now this prevalent D band uh, starting to show up. So same material, just under different conditions, different strains can drastically affect the Raman spectrum. Um, it's also important to know, note that, um, you know, Raman spectroscopy uh, requires minimum sample preparation. It's non-destructive um, and it's incredibly specific uh, to the chemical composition, structure, strain defects of a sample. So what would you like to be able to do in order to fully characterize a sample using Raman spectroscopy? Well, there are a few things. One is you'd like to be able to identify a large amount of unknown spectral features. Uh, in order to do that, you need to be able to measure a wide range of bands. So that's to say uh, modes in the sample that have um, a, a wide frequency range. In order to be able to do that, you can imagine you might want to have a band pass, say, on the order of, of 2,000 wave numbers or so to be able to fully characterize all the spectral features in a sample. At the same time, we've seen that there can be very small changes in the Raman spectrum that are sensitive to chemical composition, strain, layers, what have you. So you'd also like to be able to measure a small shift in a particular band. And in order to do this, you would need high spectral resolution, so on the order of a few wave numbers to maybe 10 wave numbers or so. So you need the accuracy of your, your system to be good, and you also need it to be very sensitive in order to detect small changes in the frequency of a band. Um, combining those, those uh, different requirements, you'd want a system that is versatile, and you would imagine you could achieve that versatility by having different gratings on the same setup. We're able to accommodate multiple gratings on our Chimera 328 spectrograph using the quad turret. So the quad turret can accommodate up to four gratings, and it really allows for a lot of flexibility and versatility in a single setup. So you can have uh, dense gratings, which would give you high spectral resolution, but low band pass, or you could have lower density gratings, which give you a higher band pass, but uh, a lower spectral resolution. You could also put gratings on there with different blazes, optimized to do work in the UV, all the way up to the shortwave infrared. Um, you can also put a mirror on there if you want to do microspectroscopy. And this versatility allows you also to work with multiple lasers. So say if you have different excitation sources, um, that can all be accommodated with, with the quad turret. In addition, it has uh, RFID tagging. So it, uh, the parameters for the grading, the optimal parameters for the grading are, are automatically um, uploaded to, 
to the spectrograph um, where they were optimized in the factory. So this really allows for ease of use when you switch between gratings. There's, there's no need to manually align. There's no need to manually optimize. These parameters are, again, optimized at the factory, pre-programmed into the spectrograph, and switching between gratings is, is as easy as clicking a button in the software. Here's an example we'd like to be able to measure a large range of bands, but also have the capability to have high spectral resolution in the same setup. Here we're looking at highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, HOPG, and N-doped graphene. If we look at figure A, we're looking at the Raman spectrum over about 2,000 wave numbers of N-graphene and HOPG. And you can see the effect of doping introduces this D-band or defect band at about 1,350 wave numbers in N-doped graphene that you don't see in HOPG. So that's pretty obvious. What's not so obvious is the 24 wave number shift to the red in N-doped graphene with respect to HOPG. It becomes more obvious when you zoom in that region of the spectrum in plot B, and you can more clearly see the shift to the red in the N-doped graphene versus the HOPG. What you can also see is that the line shapes are different between the two samples. The 2D band in graphene has only one component, while there are several components that make up the 2D band in HOPG, and that's because HOPG is structured, constructed of multiple layers and graphene is a single layer. You can imagine, in order to be able to do this, you need high spectral resolution, high accuracy, high repeatability and reproducibility, and flexibility to be able to quickly switch between a large bandpass type of measurement, as in plot A, and a measurement with higher spectral resolution, resolution, which allows you to zoom in and focus on a smaller region of the spectrum. Here's some data which shows the repeatability of a single grading on the Chimera 328. So it's a 1200 line per millimeter grading. We're looking at the 435 nanometer mercury line. And the blue trace shows 50 movements back and forth between the zeroth order and first order diffraction. That's in blue. The red trace shows 50 movements between the second order and the first order diffraction, that's in red. And you can see that the standard deviation for, for both measurements is, is quite good, uh, about two picometers for uh, the blue trace and about three picometers for the red trace. Here's some data which shows the grading to grading reproducibility on the Chimera 328. So again, we're looking at the 435 nanometer mercury line, and this trace here is showing a thousand movements back and forth between grading one and four. And you can see that the standard deviation of this measurement is the only order of, of, of five picometers. Adaptive focus is another feature in the Chimera 328. What this does is it automatically adjusts the focusing mirror position such that the best focus of the spectrograph is always achieved and you're getting the best spectral performance. This can be used to account for differences in the grading angle, to account for differences in the focus as you switch from one grading to another, or maybe even one turret to another. It can also be used to account for changes in the focus if you switch between different input or exit ports, and we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, it's completely automated, so there's no need for manual adjustment of the focus. It's done in the software at the touch of a button. It gives you the best spectral line focus automatically. Uh, it provides for ease of use, and this ease of use greatly enhances the, the versatility of that Chimera 328 because it is so um, easy to switch between multiple configurations. Another thing to consider in a Raman experiment is the measurement time. So ideally, you'd like to be able to get good quality data in the shortest time possible. So it might be a scenario where you want your system to have high throughput. Uh, another example might be a, a scenario where you're looking to detect really, really low intensity bands in your sample. There's just not a lot of signal to, the bands are just not intense and they're buried in the signal to noise. Uh, another scenario we could think of is, is if you're doing a chemical mapping of, of a sample, which would require multiple measurements on the same sample, so thousands of measurements uh, to produce this chemical map, you'd want to be able to do that quickly. Um, all three of these scenarios would, would require that you have a highly sensitive detector and, and, and what that means essentially is you'd want a detector that has um, high quantum efficiency. So the photons that get to, de to the detector are highly efficient in being converted to, to charge. And in addition to that, you'd like to have a detector which was, which was very low noise. So let's take a step back and talk about signal to noise ratios in a measurement. Your signal to noise is, is defined as your signal uh, divided by your noise. And here um, we have four different main sources of noise. Uh, so the, the overall noise is the noise that is comprised of these different sources added in quadrature. Uh, the different sources of the noise are, you have your shot noise, which is um, 
based on your quantum efficiency and also the dependent on your signal. Uh, you have your read noise, which is usually the, the camera detection limit. Um, and that's just the, um, the effect of, of, as you read this charge out, you're going to get noise. Uh, you have dark noise, which is, which is the result of thermally generated electrons in your detector. Um, you, can, you can address that by, by cooling the detector. And then you have spurious noise, which is, are due to um, clocking induced charges. Uh, typically, we define, uh, if you look at your signal here, your shot noise is, is the noise that you see on the top of that trace. Um, and then the noise floor at, at the bottom, that's, that's defined as the read noise plus the dark noise. Here's an example of where having a highly sensitive detector in a Raman setup is a useful thing. In box A, we're looking at the Raman spectrum of single-walled carbon nanotubes. The top trace is for ones that are metallic, and the bottom is for a sample that is semiconducting, and the spectra are different. The main difference you can see is this G-band at about 1600 wave numbers is much broader in the metallic sample than it is in the semiconducting sample. This broadening of the G-band has been used to differentiate between metallic and semiconducting sample types. We also see this D-band or defect band at about 1350 wave numbers as a low intensity feature in the semiconducting sample. There's also a weak feature around 1900 wave numbers, which is called the ITO-LA band. In box B, there are another set of weak features labeled IFM or intermediate frequency modes. Both sets of features are understood to be combination bands and are significantly weaker than many of the other modes in the Raman spectrum. So in order to detect these very weak spectral features, which can provide detailed information about your sample, you need a highly sensitive detector. Both IDIS and Newton CCDs can be used as highly sensitive detectors in a Raman experiment. They both offer high signal-to-noise ratios. Uh, the high signal-to-noise ratios are achieved by having a high quantum efficiency. So the quantum efficiencies of detectors can go up to uh, 95%. Um, if you look at the graph here on the right, there are different sensors, uh, each with their own quantum efficiencies that can be used in these detectors. So it's important to match the quantum efficiency of the sensor um, in the wavelength range that you're, you're going to be working in. The low noise is achieved by cooling the detector down to minus 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, this cooling is thermoelectric, so it doesn't require any liquid nitrogen. And what that does is it, it reduces the dark noise component of our overall noise term that we talked about in, in the signal noise slide a few slides back. The IDIS CCD is, is well suited for long exposures, uh, spectral rates up to 100 Hertz. While the Newton, uh, also suitable for long exposures, offers uh, spectral rates that can go up to a kilohertz. This is useful if you're looking at uh, transient phenomena that's fast, or if you're doing, say, chemical mapping, where you have to take thousands of points, uh, data points at different spots of your sample, having that higher uh, spectral rate can, can really speed up those measurements. The last slide showed that there were a multiple number of sensor options for both the IDIS and Newton CCDs. This slide I wanted to focus on uh, one specific sensor type, the BEX2DD. Uh, you can look at the quantum efficiency curve here over on the right, and you'll notice that it has a um, uh, very broadband response, high quantum efficiency in the visible all the way out to the infrared region uh, of the spectrum. Um, and what this does is it allows it to be a, a very versatile detector. So it offers one platform um, for, for detecting experiments in a wide range of regions of the spectrum in the visible. So for instance, you could do multiple laser Raman spectroscopy, excited a couple different wavelengths. That's what we're showing here on this graph, uh, 457, 552, and 785. Uh, you could also use this detector uh, to do another technique. So for instance, uh, photoluminescence or broadband absorption reflectance, which are, which are techniques that are also used to characterize these low dimensional materials. So it's, it's a versatile detector. It can be used in different regions of the spectrum and for different experimental techniques. It also has a low optical fringing with this multi-air coating technology in the near infrared. So it ensures good quantitativeness of the data. And again, it's available on both the, the IDIS and, and Newton platforms. Another way to detect very, very low signals is by using EMC CDs. So what we have here in this picture is the active area of a CCD, and we have two ADC uh, channels for readout. At the top is the conventional ADC channel for the, the regular CCD, and at the bottom is the ADC for the, the EM readout. Uh, in an EM CCD, what happens is the photoelectrons generated in the silicon are amplified by impact ionization in this, this gain register. So 
The EM gain um, amplifies the signal by impact ionization before the readout, and that ensures that the signal is not readout noise limited. Um, so what happens in the impact ionization, the photoelectrons generated in the silicon are placed in these cells. The cells are put under electric potential where impact ionization occurs. And so one photoelectron generated in the silicon now um, can produce many electrons, which can amplify your signal and um, allows the ability to detect extremely, extremely small signals uh, to the point of uh, approaching single photon detection. In this slide, we're looking at the effect of increasing the gain on EMCCD and how it can improve the signal to noise ratio in this image. So what we have here is we have a layer of PMMA on glass, and this is a confocal Raman image. The excitation wavelength is 532 nanometers, and we're looking at the CH2 stretching mode uh, at around 3000 wave numbers. So you can see on the upper left-hand uh, image here, um, the EM gain is set to a factor of 16, and on the bottom, right hand image is set to a factor of a thousand and we are increasing as we go left to right and from um, the upper road down to the bottom road we're also increasing um, and you can see this image quality gets um, much much better as we increase the gain and the reason for that is because we're improving the signal to noise ratio so by increasing the gain uh, the emccd we're multiplying that signal and so we're amplifying to the signal to the point where the noise floor now is negligible so our signal to noise is, is greatly increased by being able to amplify the signal while the noise level stays the same. This can be uh, extremely useful in detecting very, very um, low signals, uh, low photon fluxes, so approaching single photon sensitivity. Um, we can detect very, very small signals using EMC CDs. Um, what it's also useful for is, is fast readout rates. So we talked about how the read noise was one component um, uh, one term in our in our noise factor in the signal to noise uh, slide that we uh, a little while back um, that read noise increases as your your readout rate increases um, so by amplifying your signal you can account for an increase in the readout noise and scan at faster rates and still maintain good signal to noise ratio and this is useful in applications such as uh, again chemical mapping where you're collecting perhaps thousands of points um, you'd like to have a fast readout rate but maintain good signal to noise ratios. So an EMC CD can be a good choice for that. Another factor to consider in, in uh, Raman experiment would be fluorescence. So many samples, uh, many of them organic, uh, will fluoresce when they're excited in the visible. Uh, and that can cause an unwanted uh, background in your Raman spectrum. And, and I'll show you an example of that uh, in the next slide. Um, so what you'd like to be able to do is, is to minimize that fluorescence background one way to do that is to excite at longer wavelengths. So these, these uh, molecules or these samples that fluoresce in the visible won't fluoresce at longer wavelengths. Um, in order to do that, in order to obtain uh, a Raman spectrum at longer wavelengths, you'd like to have a detector that, that has better sensitivity at those longer wavelengths. So an, a detector that has enhanced sensitivity in the AIR would be beneficial if you're looking to minimize fluorescence. So this slide shows um, what I was talking about before about, about the fluorescence in a Raman spectrum. Um, here we have uh, two Raman spectra of nine methyl anthracene. Um, the top spectra was taken at 785 nanometers. The bottom spectra was taken at a long array length of 1064 nanometers. Um, you can see that the bottom spectra has, has a much, much flatter baseline than the top spectra. And the reason of that is because when we excite at 785 nanometers, the sample is fluorescing and is contributing to the baseline or the background of the Raman spectrum. So you can see here that if you excite a sample that fluoresces in the visible with a longer wavelength, you can really reduce the, um, the background contamination due to fluorescence. So how does one go about making a highly sensitive detector in the NIR? Well, let's have another look at our uh, quantum efficiency curves for our different sensors that are available in the CCDs. Um, as you can see here, the two red traces, the BRDD and the BEX2DD, offer very good quantum efficiency in the NIR. And in fact, these back illuminated CCDs um, offer better NIR quantum efficiency uh, and actually lower etaloning in the NIR than their, their visible optimized counterparts. However, the back illuminated deep depleted detectors suffer from an elevated dark current in the near IR. So even though the quantum efficiency is good, the dark current component of that noise expression goes up and your overall signal to noise goes down. Now, 
you might think you might be able to cool the detector even further to reduce the effect of the that elevated dark current. Well, that would work. It also shifts the quantum efficiency of these curves to the blue. So while you would be reducing uh, your dark current, you're also reducing your quantum efficiency and your signal to noise is not gonna get better. The way to do this is to use this pinned asymmetric inverted mode operation technology, which can reduce the dark current by about a factor of 10 versus non-inverted mode deep depleted CCDs. So what the low dark current deep depletion CCD does is it maintains your quantum efficiency um, while reducing the dark current so your overall signal to noise ratio is good. So again, what the low dark current deep depletion sensors allow one to do is they allow for less cooling, um, which lowers the quantum impact of the quantum efficiency in the NIR, but it also significantly reduces the dark noise. So it allows one to obtain the best signal to noise achievable without the need for deepest cooling. Uh, on the upper right hand side of the slide, we have two Raman spectra of the same sample. One was taken with the low dark current deep depleted uh, sensor on the top, and on the bottom, the spectrum was obtained with the, the standard back illuminated deep depleted sensor. And what the low dark current deep depleted sensor allows one to do is it allows one to extend the spectrum about 10% further into the NIR because the signal to noise ratio is still good, which is not possible with the standard back illuminated deep depleted sensor. Um, what what the, this allows one to do is it allows um, faster identification of chemical signatures. Uh, so for instance, weak Raman signatures when exciting at 785 or 833 nanometers, or say if one is looking at uh, NIR photoluminescence of some quantum materials, uh, nanomaterials, uh, it also, say if you're looking at biological samples, which are very susceptible to, to radiation damage, um, it can minimize the sample damage because the signal to noise ratio is sufficiently good um, that one can lower the exposure time. Here we're plotting the signal to noise ratio as a function of exposure time for the, the standard back illuminated detector versus the low dark current. Um, deep depleted detector. The conditions of the, uh, this measurement are the same, the same photon flux looking at the same wavelength and the sensors are, are cooled down to the same temperature. Um, what we'd like to point out is the difference in time, exposure time required to obtain the same signal to noise ratio between the two sensors. So say for instance, your experiment needed a signal to noise ratio of 10. Well, it would take you 150 seconds longer to get that signal to noise ratio on a standard back illuminated detector than it would on the low dark current uh, detector. And say for instance, your experiment required a signal to noise ratio of 25. Well, to get that on a standard back illuminated detector, it's gonna take 15 minutes longer than it would on a low dark current um, deep depleted detector. Now you can see that the difference in exposure times um, goes up quite a bit as the desired signal to noise ratio goes up and let's go back to that scenario with with the chemical mapping where now we're not just trying to acquire one data point we're trying to acquire perhaps hundreds or even thousands so these differences in exposure times can can really mount up and, and this is where the the low dark current uh, deep depletion technology and then its ability to give um great better signal to noise ratios with exposure times can be extremely useful Again, here we're plotting signal-to-noise ratios as a function of exposure time, but now we're comparing signal-to-noise ratios for a low dark current deep depleted uh, sensor thermoelectrically cooled to, to minus 95C versus a standard back illuminated deep depleted sensor cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, again, the, the conditions are the same, the photon flux is the same, we're looking at the same wavelength. And you can see that the signal-to-noise ratios between the two systems is the same. So the Thermoelectric cooled low dark current deep depleted uh, sensor can achieve the same signal to noise ratios as, uh, as a liquid nitrogen cooled standard back illuminated deep depleted sensor without the need for liquid nitrogen. Now, the last aspect of a Raman setup I'd like to talk about would be the overall uh, experimental versatility of the setup. So, in looking at 2D materials, characterizing two materials, Raman is one way um, to characterize 
low dimensional materials, but there are other uh, techniques that are also used. So second harmonic generation, phospholuminescence, um, among others. So it would be nice to be able to seamlessly switch between uh, different experiments. So be able to switch between different beam paths, not have to realign the beam into the spectrograph every time you switch from a second harmonic generation experiment to a Raman experiment, say. So what you'd want this setup to have would be multi-modality. So the ability to, to easily switch between different experimental setups. The way multimodality can be achieved on the Chimera 328 is by configuring the spectrograph with dual input and output ports. So you can see on this picture on the left-hand side here is a Chimera 328 with dual output ports, and there are two cameras attached to the spectrograph. Uh, this allows to, uh, to uh, conveniently interface between complex experiments, um, having multiple light paths. It also can minimize the switching time um, between the experimental setups, and it really enhances the versatility of the Chimera 328 to, um, to be able to use in, in, in multiple experiments in a laboratory. The Andor Software Development Kit, or SDK, can also uh, provide experimental versatility into a setup. So the SDK is compatible with LabVIEW, is compatible with MATLAB, and it's recently compatible now with Python. Uh, it's a fully customizable software platform and allows one to integrate uh, an entire experiment and all the hardware in an experiment into one program. Uh, so things for, uh, like light sources, control stages can all be uh, managed within the software development kit. Um, it also allows for data analysis, such as background subtraction, peak fitting. Uh, again, the Python compatibility is, is relatively new, but that gives, um, that gives the user access to the, the large library of, of, of Python uh, scripts and codes that, uh, that are out there. So that's all I had for today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and for your time. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. If you're unable to ask me a question right now, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at s.harrell at andor.com. Thanks and have a great day.